so we're really, really pleased to have one of our, our uh, associates here, uh, Dr. Mitch Allen, like that, um, who is an ARF research associate, as it says on the flyer, which is great, and also associate, I don't know what the title is of the Smithsonian Institute, is it the same thing, research, research associate? Uh, as well, and he uh, has a PhD uh, from UCLA in Near Eastern Studies and has done work on and off in the greater Near East for a while, and now he's back working on that project, a project there again, I believe we're going to hear about today. But in the meantime, he also, you may know, um, he has helped our out, especially due to his many years of editing and running presses of archaeological publications, among other topics, and qualitative analysis, too, um, and, and has, has done a lot of, you know, tremendous work for the greater archaeological community in the sense of disseminating information out to the world. So he's done a great deal of, of work on that and has given our uh, workshops on that, and maybe in another year we'll, we'll do that again. Um, and there's more people. Good people coming. Do want to do it? So today he's going to tell us about his his current project, which is really quite wonderful um, and something we all should be working on ourselves. I think at least the aspect of resurrecting all the data and getting it out there in the world. Uh, and he's uh, it's a project that has gone on in uh, Afghanistan uh, for some time. And we'll hear the details. So we're really, really pleased to have him come and present his current research that he's working on now. The title of it is Surveying Sistan, New Tales About an Old Archaeological Project in Afghanistan. So I'd like to have a very warm welcome for Dr. Mitch. So, uh, we can't call it fake news, we can't call it old news. This is a legacy project from the 1970s. Uh, people know about legacy projects, they're things that you find files of data that somebody's uh, filing the cabinet and then try to turn around and publish it. In this particular case, the people who stuck all those things in those files are still alive. Uh, I was a young graduate student when I, this project first, first took place in the 1970s. The uh, PI of uh, William Trousdale is now 88 years old and still alive and kicking. And our geologist is also helping with it. So um, it's uh, a, leg a legacy project with a, with a twist. Um, the, because of the fact this was a 10 year archaeological project, our, uh, uh, my discussion here is going to be necessarily very superficial. Just trying to get some of the highlights of it and how, how we're going about doing it. Uh, there's a lot more to be said, but uh, you don't want to stay here until 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, let me start by thanking people who are, have been involved in this project. There's a, it takes a whole village to do an archaeological project, but each, each and every one of you know. Uh, some of the people who have actually helped me locally in uh, 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 working on uh, shirts, uh, descriptions, and, and labeling are here, and I thank you specifically, and thank ARF specifically for uh, allowing me the uh, institutional support to be able to make this happen. But let's talk about what this project was. Uh, Bureau, it is an archaeological survey of the region of Sistan. For those of you who are not familiar with Central Asian and West Asian archaeology, Sistan is the southwest corner of Afghanistan, where it borders upon borders of Pakistan and Iran. Uh, running through it is the Helmand River, which is the largest river in Afghanistan, therefore it is a route between both North and South, between Central Asia and South Asia, and also between the Near East and, and Asia. Uh, it has been known historically since uh, documented documents from the 6th century BC. Alexander the Great's armies marched through here on his way to India. Uh, it is the home of Rustam, who is the hero of the Shah Mei, the Iranian epic, and also uh, the homeland of Zoroastrianism. So uh, it's known a lot historically. Uh, there's been a lot of archaeological work done on the other side of the border in Iran, but very little done in, in Afghanistan. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the Helmand Sistan project, of which I was a part, began in 1971 and ran through 1979. Uh, it was uh, between the Smithsonian Institution and the um, Afghan Government Department of Archaeology, which has gone through several name changes over the time. We were given concession for the entire west southwest corner of the country to do anything we wanted archaeologically there. This is back in the 70s, remember? And uh, we, so we had an area of 40,000 square miles to cover. <laughs> uh, we had a team of four or five uh, Western scholars coming. Uh, we had a Afghan Department of Antiquities representative with us every season. A couple of uh, 
uh, support people from coal, and also we hired local workmen in the villages to help do some of the digging for us. So you know, you've seen Facebook where they're down, you know, you get to put your picture from 10 years ago when you joined Facebook and your picture today. Well, here's my version of that. Uh, Mitch Allen and Bill Trousdale, circa 1974. Mitch Allen and Bill Trousdale, circa 2017. Let me tell you a bit about Bill. He, is, uh, he was retired as a curator of anthropology in the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian. Um, uh, he, is now, he retired in 96, so he's been uh, out of there for 20 years now. He's a specialist in Central Asia, in South Asia, and also on East Asian art. He worked in the Freer Gallery before that. Uh, he's, also, he's done all kinds of work on Central Asia, both ancient and contemporary, studying uh, British uh, armies and explorers in Central Asia, as well as the archaeology of it. Uh, he's also, in addition to this work, writing a book on the history of the city of Kandahar, Afghanistan, in the 19th century. Uh, I, on the other hand, was a first-year graduate student at the University of Michigan, looking for additional field work. Uh, Bill found me and put me into his project for a couple of seasons. I worked for two of the ten seasons. Then I got a job in public publishing, and I had a hard time explaining to my boss why I needed three months off of my first year of work. So I dropped uh, archaeology and didn't come back to this project until uh, a couple of years ago, um, 30 plus years later. Uh, the project ended in 1979 because it was not possible to do field work after that. Uh, those of you, I'm sure all of you know, the Soviet invasion of uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 79 and a series of wars that have gone on ever since then. Uh, another thing about Sistan, though, it is one of the centers of the opium trade. And so it has always been dangerous to be working in Sistan because uh, of the opium dealers and the opium smugglers that went across the border and bring things into Iran. Uh, there, we are not the first people to do archaeological work in this reason, region. There was a British Boundary Commission that tried to establish the border between Afghanistan, Iran, and what was then British India, and one of their members wrote a very lengthy monograph about uh, the archaeological remains of Sistan. Uh, Sir Oral Stein, who was a very well-known archaeologist who worked in, in East Asia and Central Asia, uh, worked here as well, although on the other side of the border. Uh, there were uh, French scholars in the 30s, German scholars in the 50s, uh, Walter Fairservice and Norman Hammond, who were uh, two well-known uh, American scholars who've done work there as well, the three projects, and be probably best known to the Berkeley people is George Dales, who was a faculty member here, who spent a couple of seasons in, uh, uh, in this region as well. He decided to move from here to Harappa when he went out into the field, and was driving his uh, Jeep around and had, had it shot at several times by other people thinking that he was either one of the, the rival smuggler or the federal is coming, coming to get the rival smugglers. So uh, he wisely went, moved to uh, uh, Pakistan to do field work instead. But of all these projects, none of them has been this long-term, large-scale attempt to create an entire cultural history of the region. No one's been there that long or worked as long in Sistan as we have. And so what we do, is, what we are producing is fairly important understand what the system is all about. We didn't publish very much. Uh, a couple of uh, popular articles, uh, a couple of small research pieces, and a, a geology monograph. Largely because uh, Bill had a vision of this of the book, of the uh, final report being in one very large book that contained everything in it. So while there's pieces of it that were done, there was never much published out of it. Uh, and also, he always had hopes to be able to return back to Afghanistan to do additional work. So, uh, uh, even though this, this project is 40 plus years old, uh, almost nothing has been published out of it. <coughs> then I retired from publishing and called Bill up and said, Well, Bill, it uh, doesn't look like you're going to finish. You need some help. Let me try to do it with you and for you. So, uh, I've been working on this for the past couple of years. I've given half a dozen talks at different professional conferences. There's one paper in the press right now. Um, we've received a grant from the Levy Foundation to help us get the, the material published uh, in one or several volumes. We plan on uh, archiving our data with the National Anthropological Archive and provide that data for a variety of other archives that will be able to integrate the material that we found into the larger picture of people who, are, who do archaeology. So how do you restart a project like this that has been untouched for uh, a couple of decades? Well, the first step was excavating Bill's garage. <laughs> uh, field notebooks, photographs, slides, maps, you name it, notes, 
files. Uh, I've gone back to this place maybe 10 times now. Every time I go through the garage and I find more boxes of things. We're still missing a bunch of photographs and slides. I know they exist somewhere, but we still haven't managed to reach that strata in the excavation yet. Um, some, some of the material is located at Smithsonian where he worked. The uh, plans were all there. We've had them scanned for us. And in a rush to, uh, uh, for the, when the U.S. left Afghanistan in 1979, they called him up and said, we have a bunch of material that you're working on at the, the U.S. Embassy. What do you want with it? He said, ship it to me in Washington. And so there actually is a collection of materials, maybe 10% of our materials, that are in Washington uh, at the Smithsonian right now. I've had conversations with the uh, director of the museum, of the uh, National Museum in Kabul, and we plan to repatriate this material after we finish uh, analyzing it. Um, there was, most of the actual material itself was left in Afghanistan, in Lashkargah and Kabul. Uh, Lashkargah was, uh, I've been told that the American buildings there were blown up by the Russians worried about uh, what might be inside of them, and so I don't think we'll ever find most of that material again. And as you all know, the Kabul Museum was crashed during these wars. Uh, there may be some fragments that people might be able to pull out of that, but uh, it's unlikely to ever see any of the original material again. So literally all we have are our notes and photographs. Uh, to avoid that possibility of, of losing that material, the first thing we did was digitize things, and there were, we've been working on that for two years now, we probably have something in the neighborhood of 30 or 40,000 uh, uh, dig digital images of various notes and photographs and so on and so forth, uh, so that and the materials can spread around a variety of different cities, so we're not likely ever to lose the material that I've managed to excavate out of the garage. Uh, we've had, um, we had a pot party at my house where we actually, some of the shirts were actually drawn, photographed, and described. Uh, some of the people who did that are located here today. Thank you so much for your help on all this. We will have to have a second pot party sometime soon. You're all welcome. Uh, one of the uh, nicer things that we managed to run across was that the University of Chicago received a contract from the Afghan government to create a national map plotting all the known archaeological sites in, in the entire country on that map to help preserve those sites. Uh, we managed to get, we gave them all of our data, our locational data, and they have now plotted all of our sites onto their maps, which helps us a great deal because they've helped they've been able to produce maps for us and also helped them a great deal because we had, you know, a huge collection of archaeological sites that uh, in Afghanistan we could tell them a lot about what they were, and so we've been working together with the University of Chicago on this project. Um, uh, 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 for us. Uh, but there's still a lot more to do, and even though I will end up getting the basic descriptions of all the sites and the time periods done, uh, we have lots of little things there that if any of you have graduate students or are graduate students or are interested in uh, looking further at it, we collected botanical information from the deserts in, in Sistan and have those things, I have photographs of those, the originals are in Washington. Uh, we found a, a site that had tons of mad impressions on the base, so we were interested in basketry and weaving. Uh, uh, we have uh, dozens of shirts like this that were, should require a paper at some point from somebody. Uh, if anybody's interested, and there are others like this, if anybody's interested or has a graduate student interested, have them please contact me. So, with all that, as a preface, what did we actually find in Sistan working there for 10 years? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about the, the region itself. Sistan, again, the southwestern corner of the country. The Helmand River is the primary feature running through it. The Helmand starts in eastern Afghanistan, runs through the entire country. It's the largest river in the entire country, and it ends in the Hamun Lakes, which are these very shallow, brackish lakes that are on the western border between Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, because of the fact that it is a river that traverses through mountains and deserts both, it has been a route, and we know it's probably always been occupied because of the, of the river being there and because it is a route between east and west and also between north and south. The Helmand Valley itself in Sistan region is fairly narrow, somewhere between one and four kilometers wide, not very uh, big, and probably could not. Uh, Accommodated that large population, we probably won't know because of the alluviation created by the river. Most of the sites that are in the river valley are probably meters and meters down under the surface. And of course, doing a survey project, you'll never find that stuff. So uh, at some point, uh, we have some sites in the river valley, but uh, most of what we found was either on the bluffs overlooking the river or in areas away from the river. The the Helmand Valley.
Valley is surrounded by deserts um, with lovely names like the Dash of Bargo, which means the Desert of Death, <laughs> the Dash of Jehanum, the Desert of Hell, or the Registan, the, uh, the Land of Sand. Um, uh, so you, you can get a sense of what the, what the terrain is like, and it really is a pretty rough place to live. It's marginal uh, living land in almost any time, except if you're near the river where you have access to water and good soil. Um, in addition to working through the Helmand River, we also worked in uh, previous riverbeds of the Helmand, here the Rudi Biabad, the Shila Rud, the Gaudizira, which we know contained water in earlier times, uh, and we did survey work along those as well. Uh, as you can see, they're dry now. And we also worked oops, to the east of the Helmand River in this region here called Sarotar. Uh, most of our work, in fact, was in Sarotar. Uh, Sar the Sarotar Plain is probably 50 meters by 25 meters in kilometers, by 25 kilometers in size. We found most of our archaeological sites there. You can see it's uh, not occupied now. It's all vast desert covered by sand dunes. You can also see archaeological sites popping up all over the place here. It's not, uh, the place is rich with archaeological remains. Uh, here's a, a plotting of what we found there. Uh, an enormous number of archaeological remains in Sarotar. Uh, and again, because it's abandoned, we didn't have to worry about land rights, water, trying to get over canals, um, or anything else. It was just, it was all up there for us to look at. So the entire region is largely shaped by wind. Uh, winds come out of the northwest constantly. They are come at various different speeds in various different ways. But uh, it is a very windy environment, and as you can see, it picks up sand and dirt and blows it around, making it very uncomfortable sometimes. In the summer, it's impossible to do field work, although several have tried. Uh, the wind of 120 days runs between May and September, and the wind will often, often be a hurricane force, 75 miles an hour or higher, um, and the temperatures in the 110s and 120s. So it's not really great archaeological time. We went in the fall, and even then we got caught in one windstorm that, as you can see, ripped our, our uh, camp completely into shreds. Uh, again, it was uh, hurricane force winds. But it has all, but it has shaped the living patterns there. I won't be able to go into great detail on that. But it also has shaped the archaeological visibility. As you can see, the entire landscape basically gets sand, sandblasted every year. Uh, and we have found, we've had a couple of places where we could determine that there were at least two or three meters of soil that had been sandblasted away based upon what we found and how we, how far below the current, the ancient soil level it was. Uh, it also doesn't do wonderful things for, uh, for objects. You can see these once were all four ribbed <coughs> jars. Only one of them looks like that anymore. If you're on, if it's on the surface, it very easily gets, uh, gets eroded away. In order to live outside of the area right next to the river, uh, canals were needed, and so uh, dams were built. Uh, we, we know this was the case, and possibly looking very much like the contemporary dams to raise the water level and shoot things out through canals. Uh, Sarotar, where we worked, there was a canal that started here in the root bar area, parallel the river for a while, and then went off into the desert. Uh, these canals were very long, some of them were over 100 kilometers in length which obviously requires an enormous amount of uh, manpower, people power, and enormous social organization to be able to pull off. These things were not small canals. You can see our geologists are based on one of them. So we could, you can imagine the, the labor that was involved in, in building these. But at certain times, it was able to be able to occupy the Sarwatar using this canal irrigation and, uh, and, and canals in order to be able to farm that region. Uh, ours was largely a survey project, so uh, we spent a lot of time driving up and down the River Valley, walking up and down through Sarotar because driving over sand dunes is not particularly easy. When we find sites, we would usually record them, photograph them, uh, draw them if the architecture was drawable, and uh, take, take a collection of shirts to bring, to bring back. Uh, some of the more elaborate sites, we actually did formal uh, surveying and drawing of, and in a few, in a over time, we ended up excavating probably nine or ten or twelve different sites. You can see that the uh, te technique was not uh, your contemporary modern archaeology <laughs> kind of excavation. But again, remember this is the 1970s that we're talking about, and for digging in Central Asia, uh, this uh, 
this was kind of standard operating procedure back in those days. We did do a couple of fairly unusual things. This was, again, the beginning of the new archaeology, and so we tried a few of these new archaeology things, uh, like collecting botanicals that we thought might be useful someday. Um, our uh, Afghan representative, Gulama Montamari, uh, interviewed uh, local villagers uh, along the Helmand River to try to get a sense of village life, to do an ethnography of the Helmand River. Uh, he wrote a, a uh, monograph on that in Pashto. We've had it translated into English and will appear as part of our final, final report. Uh, our geologist also was very actively involved in trying to understand the landforms, climate, hydrology, and so on and so forth. So we did things that weren't necessarily old-style archaeology, although for the most part our project was pretty old-style. Uh, and ultimately we ended up with somewhere between 150 and 200 sites, depending on how you want to count them. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot along the river valley, a lot of the Sarantar area, and a few a lot of the western uh, air, uh, river courses that we also study, although we do not spend a lot of time there. There are a lot of sites that were, had been identified by previous researchers, some you know, very large visible sites uh, that had been preserved for hundreds and often thousands of years. Uh, we tended to stay away from those because Someone had already documented those. We, look, we were looking more for things that had not been previously known or documented. So we didn't do a lot of these kind of places. And ultimately what we ended up with was an archaeological chronology. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy around the edges because, again, doing survey work, there's only so much that you can tell as far as dating. Uh, we had a few gaps in the archaeological record. It probably doesn't, those gaps probably don't exist. There probably were people living there since it's unlikely that River Valley was ever completely abandoned, but we aren't able to identify archaeologically what those time periods looked like in terms of material culture in order to be able to understand who might have lived there. Uh, I'm going to talk about several of these time periods, the Hellenistic part of the Sassanian period, Iron Age, and the Sephardic Gaznami period, and the Tamar period, as we get a little further along. Um, we found Bronze Age materials. Uh, Bronze Age is very well known in this area. Those of you who have studied this know Shadi Sokhta, which is a very famous 3rd millennia BC site. We found several other smaller sites in the general vicinity. We found also a, a few archaeological sites along the river valley that contained small amounts of Bronze Age materials. Not surprising. We don't have really that much to add to the discussions of Bronze Age, other than the fact that, yes, people did live in the river valley then. So uh, I won't uh, dwell on that, but we do, we do have things that go back probably to the 3rd millennium BC uh, in our region. Okay. Um, and we were the first people there, the, both felt fair surveys and Dales, when they uh, excavated in this, and uh, surveyed in this area, uh, were looking specifically for bronze age materials, and so uh, there's already a fair literature on that if we can add a little bit to. But one thing that does puzzle, did puzzle both of them and has puzzled people working in Iran, Shari Softa, this large site in Iran, is abandoned somewhere around 1800 BC. There is no evidence of anybody living in Iranian Sistan between then and about 600 BC. The place is abandoned and no one really knows why. Uh, our guess is that the river at some point went to the west, there's Shari Softa there, and at some point the river jumped its banks and headed north instead. And we claim that, one, because of the absence of any living on the western part of Sistan, while at the same time we find, in our area, a entire culture that is previously unknown uh, archaeologically, uh, the early Iron Age culture of Afghan Sistan. We found it at this, first at this site called Kala 169, when we visited it two or three times, found a bunch of painted pottery there that looked vaguely Bronze Age, and so went back and uh, dug a bunch of trenches at the site in order to be able to try to find out more about it. Uh, the site itself was built on a paksa, which is a packed mud platform. There were some uh, mud brick extensions and buildings on it, and then a later overburden from uh, a thousand years later from the Parthian and Sasanian periods. But the original stuff here on top of the Paksa platform and along the side of the Paksa platform is unknown archaeologically, and uh, we are the first to actually figure out what this, thing, this stuff is. You can, as you can see, there's painted pottery. Um, 
It's an unusual style that we have that hasn't been found. We have, have found no direct correlates to it. As we did more surveying in Sistana, and having found this one site, we could find other sites that had the same type of material on it, so that we believe, when we finally added it all up, that there really is a whole culture here that dates to this gap, somewhere between 1800 and 600 BC. Uh, we probably narrowed more like to 1200 to 700 based upon what we found. Um, the pottery itself is very unusual. Um, Hard-fired redware, uh, it's over-fired to gray almost in many cases, and uh, has geometric designs on it uh, that, are, that are very distinctive with a lot of uh, lozenges and circles and suns and all geometric. Uh, most of it is actually very simple uh, lines, but this is some of the more elaborate pieces. Once we had a sense that there was a culture here, we started looking for other sites that like that. We found seven other similar sites, mounds, like it in Sarotar. Each of them has identical, had identical ceramics to this particular one, this particular site, Apollo 169, and also had uh, identical formation of the site. There was a platform on the northwest, which is the direction the wind comes from, and then there was a uh, compound beneath it, an occupation both on top and next to it, same thing here, here's the mound, here's the compound down here, same thing up there, and the policy that I've already showed you. So in any way, there's, there's a, a close similarity between all of these sites, both in terms of their material culture and in terms of the way they're designed. Uh, there's obviously something going on here that's a design, and, and of course you needed all these canals to get there too. So somebody was there doing something big for, during this period of time. Uh, once we had this culture identified, we went back through our older collections and future collections and found that there were sites all along the River Valley as well as in Sarotar. So we now have over 20 sites that we can identify from this time period. Again, there's nothing similar on the other side of Sistan, on the, African, on the Iranian side, nor have we found anything like it uh, anywhere else. How do you date this? Well, we took a whole bunch of carbon dates from the uh, from our excavations at Column 169, we want to look at sort of the, the dates, the minus of BC, BCE. Um, and as you can see, there's absolutely no consistency. The ones that are all the same color were all taken from largely the same place. So they should all be the same. Each, each color should have the same, approximately the same dates. And as you can see, they vary widely. So the, car the carbon dates don't help us very much to narrow it down. They range between the 3rd century and the 16th century BC. Uh, the vast number of them actually run somewhere between the 8th and 12th century. So that's what we have tried to, to date this uh, collection from, uh, in the absence of any close uh, material culture parallels. We excavated another site called Konakala number 2, because there's also a Konakala number 1, uh, that's in the river valley, about right here. Uh, because we found uh, material from a variety of different time periods uh, on the surface, and the fact that sort of played out <coughs> in our excavation, we found all of the pre Islamic levels the Sasanian from the mid first millennium AD to E, uh, Parthian early first millennium, uh, Hellenistic uh, late BC, and Achaemenid uh, sort of mid first millennium BC, uh, all stratified in this at this particular site. We also found both Bronze Age and our early Iron Age stuff that came up in the collections, though we did not find a layer. So we have to assume those are farther down, those are deeper in the, in the site. Uh, there are documented remains from the times of the Persian Empire, uh, the 6th to the 4th century BCE. Uh, again, we don't have all that much to add to the discussions other than the fact that we have them. Uh, but we did start finding Hellenistic remains and found, in fact, a couple of Hellenistic temples. Uh, from the time after Alexander the Great traversed through the Elmont River. Um, we were uh, put onto Khwaja Kandur by a uh, collector who also worked as a contractor for the U.S. government working in Afghanistan, who hired people to go and loot the site and showed us his 4,000 objects. Uh, I'm talking to his son, trying to get them to repatriate the material without success yet, but I'm still working on that. Uh, they were all found on this hilltop. When we went up to the hilltop, we found some of our own materials that also look like things that would come from a Greek temple, right? Um, but there's no sign of any architecture there except a shrine to a uh, recent Islamic holy man. 
Uh, and it's not uncommon that people will bring materials to put on these shrines. Uh, we did find nearby at a site called Mokatar uh, what looked like the remains of a Hellenistic temple. And so uh, it was outside our survey area, so we didn't do a full write up of it. But we're pretty sure that the material from the site of Kajur came originally from Mokatar. There was a second Hellenistic temple farther down the river valley. Let's see where the arrow has it located at a place called Sayak. Uh, the winds were not very kind to Sayok and has basically eroded the site all the way down pretty much to the foundation levels of the other buildings. Uh, but we were able to pull them enough together to get a plan. You can see the entire hill was covered with site. This is right, up, right above the, uh, the valley. And in the center was what looks like a big temple. You know, there's a colonnade in the front, so there's an antechamber, chamber, there's a cella. Again, we were at foundation level, so we couldn't find out very much about it. But we were also lucky enough to find the well for the cell one, and uh, then decided to excavate the well 15 meters down the water table. Uh, the poor Afghan guy was sent out every day. <laughs> I would, I'm glad it wasn't him. Um, and to our delight and expectation, when once the well stopped being used, people would throw all the junk into it. And so we were able to find all kinds of materials. There's figurines like this goat or monkey or whatever it is, uh, pieces of architectural fragment that look very Greek. And most important of all, we found an inscription that uh, probably sat on top of the uh, temple when it was in, was in use. Uh, Greek characters, I don't read it. Uh, it may not be the Greek language, probably is not the Greek language. Uh, we've sent it to a couple of specialists in, in uh, England to read for us. And also you'll note, in addition to the Greek characters, there's also graffiti in an Aramaic language and Aramaic characters uh, on this, and they're, they're reading that as well. Anyway, that, that should help tell us a lot about the site once we get, uh, get it back from that. Um, the next period after the Hellenistic, the Parthian period, probably the first couple of centuries BCE and the first couple of centuries CE, uh, is probably the time of the greatest, largest occupation ever in Sistan. Uh, we found more sites dated to Parthian times than any other time period. And to support that, the Iranian archaeologists who work on the other side of the border have also been doing surveys. And you can see their area here, actually this area right there, and they found a huge number of Parthian sites uh, on the Iranian side of the border as well. Sarotar, the area uh, to the east, was heavily occupied at that time. Canals were fully used. We have all kinds of uh, agricultural settlements and buildings. Uh, we found a series of jars, you know, sets of jars that were set into the ground. There were probably were structures associated with them that had been eroded away, but the jars themselves, because they were set in the ground, still exist. And we don't know what, uh, back in those days, you couldn't do residue analysis. So we, did, we don't know whether that was water or grain or some kind of liquid or whatever it was. But uh, we, we, do have, we do have a dozen sites or more that were just these jars that were probably represented uh, agricultural uh, homes. Um, interestingly, because of the fact this is a crossroad, we have the Hellenistic crowd. We also have um, Zoroastrian shrines. We, have, we found three of them in, uh, in Sarvatar, uh, in, excuse me, in, uh, in Sistana. Uh, the first one being Shnakala, which is located on top of a large uh, mound of uh, volcanic stone. Uh, a shrine way on the top, there you can see it. Uh, it's directly across the Helmand River from Koikonashin, which is the one mountain in this area, and therefore the most visible part of the landscape. You can see it from anywhere. And the site was a series of terraces leading up to the summit. Uh, as you can see, each terrace was walled off with a narrow gate leading up to the next one. And on the very top where that building is, was a chartok. Uh, those of you not familiar with uh, Iranian archaeology, a chartok is a building that actually consists of four corner pillars, no walls in between, but a dome on the top, and then a fire structure of some sort to burn some kind of sacred fire uh, in the middle. And uh, we found that here. Uh, on this site, so we're pretty sure this is not a traditional fire temple, it's some kind of uh, Zoroastrian holy holy building. 
Um, there are parallels to this. The best known is Kui Huaja, which is on the other side of the border, on the right hand side of the border. It also sits on a pile of volcanic stone uh, and also has a series of, of terraces leading up to their char top, way up on top there. Uh, so that the conceptually, even though Kui Huaja is way more elaborate than we have, uh, conceptually they're very much the same in, in very many ways. Uh, a second uh, fire temple. Uh, we call it Temple 215. Uh, we found in the Sarotar area. Uh, we've, it has, again, very traditional uh, Zoroastrian architecture. There's a central fire room here, which we found uh, layers of ash buried inside of it, and Iwan, which is an open ended room leading to the outside in front of it, an antechamber, and an ambulatory walkway that goes around it all, which is very, it's, which is standard architecture for these kinds of structures. Um, we have a third one that's much more fragmentary than we found in Saratar. Um, in interestingly, the walls are very heavily plastered, and when uh, we believe that after the last plastering, someone, some uh, graffiti artist went and carved a giant phallus, testes, and walls on, on, the, uh, on the walls of the temple. We assume it was no longer occupied at the point. And in addition to our Zoroastrian and our Greek Hellenistic style culture uh, shrines. We also have Buddhist stupas. We have three of them. One of them we actually excavated sitting on top of this hill in Kanago Har. You can see where that is on the map there. Uh, around the structure, there's a walkway around it. Uh, it sits on top of a hill, and below that, there's a series of caves where the uh, monks probably lived. We haven't, uh, there was almost no material culture that we can find there, so it's hard to date that. But again, it's very likely that we have Greek, Zoroastrian, and Buddhist co-occupation of this same area at the same time. Once the area is conquered by, by Islam, uh, Saratar becomes the province of a dynasty called the Sephardids. And the Sephardids, uh, existed in the 9th and 10th centuries. They were a petty kingdom of warriors who kept fighting with their neighbors and were, very, were all about warfare and defense. We have written records of who they were and who began who. Uh, but they, they, Sistan was their, was their base. Uh, they built this city called Shari Gogola. Oops. That one. And as it was all about defense. There are, as you might see, there are five different wall systems. There are three different moats protecting the, the, the house. Uh, the walls are 10 meters high. The moats 25 to 40 meters wide and two meters deep. It's huge. Uh, and they were obviously very concerned with the def their defense. Um, the city they built inside of it consists of a palace, some other structures, a mosque, a bazaar, and caravanserai to the north. The palace on the Citadel is very unusual because the walls aren't square to start with, and the walls aren't straight, they're serpentine. We don't know any parallels in Islamic architecture. If any of you know some, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but we think, this, as far as we know, this, this site is unique. We know the store, this building had three stories. We found a stairway going down and windows from the lower levels. You can also see way up here, the flooring of a third floor, so it's a three-story palace. And the central feature was a uh, audience hall, again, shaped like a char top, four corner pillars and a dome in the center. Uh, and that was the main public area of the palace. Dating it was extremely difficult, uh, primarily because uh, water techniques were not that good. And secondly, most, uh, well, for a variety of reasons, our dating was not very good. We have everything from largely uh, uh, Sasanian pre-Islamic remains underneath the walls of the palace right there, but also uh, Safarid time things, and even later Ghazanid time. <coughs> but as we dug deeper, we discovered that they had built an original palace here, because beneath the Islamic palace, there is a Sasanian palace, and even below that, a Parthian palace. So the original building was probably built somewhere in the first couple centuries CE, rebuilt by the Sasanians in the mid-first century, mid-first millennium, 
and then later rebuilt by the Spartans. Uh, we worked also around the interior of the, uh, inside the circular wall, found another public building, and that gave us all the Safari pottery we need. Uh, those of you who do Islamic pottery, you call it mostly Samanic pottery, but it's the same time period from Eastern, from Iran and, and other places around there, and that gives us confidence that the buildings on top, as well as the buildings on the terrace, date to this, to this 9th and 10th century period. Um, I won't talk anything about the mosque, but there's the mosque and the street next to it, and then the caravanserai. When the Ghaznavids came in, Mahmoud of Ghaz Ghazni, who, was a, who ruled all of Afghanistan in the 11th century, uh, they redid the site, added a few things, particularly the lower palace here. The lower palace is a very sumptuous building, the large courtyard, four iwans and the open ended rooms on each side, and then on the other side, another courtyard with town eight. Again, this is something that is, as far as we know, unique in Islamic architecture. I don't know any, we haven't found any parallels to this yet. If any of you know something, let us know because we'd like to be able to find uh, something that's similar to that, but as far as we know, there is not. We do know that this particular building was dated from the time of the Ghaznavids, 11th century, 12th century. Uh, Lashkari Bazaar, which was one of their palaces, is, had, was excavated by the French, and you can see the ornamentation, these large keyhole arches, the use of uh, bricks as decoration, and we have an identical thing here at, at, our, at our palace. And the plans, again, are the same. Uh, large courtyard, Ruans, small courtyard, they have four, we have eight. The site was destroyed, conquered, you know, historically by Genghis Khan in 1222, we actually found coin hoards of which the last day is coincidentally 1222. <laughs> Lovely, it's the one of those things work together, work out right, don't they? Anyway, but that's, uh, we do have these, these coin hoards. Uh, the coins are among our missing things. They were given to the, the numismatics department. The Smithsonian never returned, and now they claim they don't have it. So at some point, we may have to go convey them. Uh, the last occupation of of Shari Gogola and less large occupation of the region generally was during Timura times, this is the 14th and 15th century, under time after Tamerlane. Uh, they did not do a lot with the palaces that they that were so nicely sitting there, but they did build themselves a lot of nice homes around uh, around there and built and drew canals into them. There was some reuse of the bathhouse that was built in the Ghaznavid times, and to our surprise and horror, uh, on top of the pile of ash from the heater, the heating room element, uh, we found eight skulls uh, decapitated, each of them drilled through the forehead with a sharp object. The headless skeletons were found several hundred meters away, buried in a wall. There are well-known sites in, throughout this area from Timurid times. We documented some of them, like Kalas Rock, which is a very large one, right by the river, as you can see. But one of the things that was really unique was that when the canal system in Sarotar was filled in and stopped being used, people locked their doors and walked away and left their, their buildings intact. Uh, it's also remote enough that there's not been a lot of looting, and so there's a huge number of buildings that are almost complete sitting there uh, across this entire region. And we, our claim is that this is probably the most uh, complete collection of pristine 15th century architecture you're going to find anywhere in the world. It hasn't been touched since then. Um, here's one of the aerial photos of one of the villages called the house, but you can see there's two dozen houses there. All of them, some of them, some of them feel still three stories high, uh, sitting there untouched, where they ha and they haven't been touched very much since the 15th century. Uh, we excavated in one set of these houses, I did that myself, and in the material we found all kinds of organic materials like cloth, uh, bone, uh, rope, and so on and so forth. The landscape itself is almost untouched. You can see right here, you can see a canal that was used in the 15th century. You can see the field walls where they were doing agriculture. You can see the clay piping leading, bringing water to the house. All that stuff is just sitting in the black on the surface. Uh, it would be lovely to go back if you possibly could and really do a study, a full study of that. 15th century uh, community because it's enormous and it's literally untouched. Um, 
mausoleum that still that still stand almost complete, a dove coat where they raised doves. Anyway, that, that was the last major occupation of the area. There have been people living there, obviously, constantly since then. Uh, this one site called Ziyarati Yamiran is a, uh, a sh modern shrine. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a giant mound of uh, uh, goat horns outside that came from offerings. We did find a 10th century, to 11th century building that is destroyed on the outside of it. So there's lots, uh, there's, there are obviously people still live there and it's still being used. Some of these buildings have been reused from uh, earlier times. Um, there's lots, a lot to be done and we only were able to scratch the surface after a decade. Unfortunately, no one's gonna be able to go back anytime soon. So it's uh, uh, what we have discovered and what we have, uh, what we will finally report on after 40 years delay uh, is probably going to be the only thing that people will know about Sistan for a long time to come. But hopefully then some of you, if things ever get better and some of you want, I'd go back there because the archaeological treasures are just waiting to be, uh, to be explored. Thank you. Thank you.
by uh, beside the eight skulls that you find, did you find any human remains from Bronze or Iron Age? Yes. Um, we found in uh, one of these, these mountain sites with the compounds around it, we found a couple of burials that had been uh, exposed by the wind. Uh, they are very similar to burials from Central Asia from the same time period, the early Iron Age. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we do have stuff like that. Uh, but again, we didn't take them anywhere. They're left yeah. in the ground, so they're, uh, they're, they're not available. They're not, I can send you photographs of what we do with that. But uh, nothing to do with the analysis. Yeah. Huh. From uh, what you were saying, a lot of pictures, it looked like the buildings were really eroded by the wind and by sand. I couldn't tell from the pictures, but what kind of building materials were people using in this but, uh, it was either either packed mud, oxen, mud brick, or baked brick. Okay. Uh, later periods they used baked brick, but earlier stuff it was all mud. It was almost all mud brick. And of course, one of the criteria for creating these things is sizes of the mud bricks. So those change over over different times. Uh, I didn't get into that at all. But, but we do have we do have a, in addition to having a ceramic chronology, we also have a mud brick chronology. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you really learned about the new styles in the Islamic architecture. Well, actually, it's, it's common in uh, Islamic architecture that they mix some of the features, like the ones you showed, yeah. with some of the local uh, designs, actually, uh, like the local style of architecture. Huh. And then they usually come with, uh, with something different, this kind of local internalization of Islamic art. And it becomes completely original. So under one time period, we see multiple uh, designs. Uh, so my question is, did you find some features that were actually present in the region before and then it was mixed with this architecture? Or is it completely... Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm still trying to find parallels to some of these things. I've been looking through Islamic architecture for the, the wavy line, the serpentine walls. Haven't found any. The next step is to see if there's any Sasanian buildings that are built like that. Um, again, the people I've asked haven't, don't know of them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. But yes, I, I, uh, to have that kind of regionalization would make an awful lot of sense. But again, we, we found one site that has this 81 courtyard, but it's the Alhambra in, in Spain. <laughs> and and it postdates this thing by four or five hundred years. So who knows? There, there might in fact be other buildings like that, uh, but we haven't uncovered any in our, in our research yet. Which is why I'm hoping that some of you who are experts on it like yourself uh, can, if you ever see something, let me know because that would be lovely. Thank you. Yes? Um, I have a question about the canals and dams. Um, from the ethnography that your colleague did, do you know if this organization is tribal, like what we have south of Iraq, with this thing, kind of organic material, is it like sedentary based uh, for construction of these basically temporary dams that have to be renewed? Well, as you can see, this, these particular dams <coughs> weren't even built uh, as permanent structures. Yeah. They were uh, stones inside of uh, woven baskets yeah, exactly. and were to raise them. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, there are written documents from the early 20th century that talk about built dams uh, along the Helmont and along the canals leading from the Helmont. So uh, I, uh, there, there's, there's obviously a variety of different styles that were, uh, that were, that were used. Uh, we don't really know what it looked like in the Bronze Age or the Parthian period or the Gazan period. Uh, we only, we, we only kill this. The ones that you document, they do, I saw that they contemporary ones. That's what they were. Yeah. Were they tribal? You know, what was their Oh, were they, were they tribal in the sense of, yeah. of, of different tribes down in different yeah, areas? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to the question. Mm. Uh, I haven't looked at that part of it. I haven't looked at the whole monograph yet, so I'll, I'll go back and look at that. That's what that's what we Anybody else? Left have to stand for a while. <laughs> 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 well, thank you. Well, thank you all.